My name is Zach Saylor. I'm a fourth year graduate student at the University of Oregon uh, in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. And I'm a computationalist in a primarily experimental lab and actually experimental department as a whole. And so uh, what I'm going to share with you guys today is how Jupiter has really helped me bridge the gap between computationalists and experimentalists um, in a variety of different ways. Uh, and so this is going to be more of a high level uh, talk, not super technical about how to implement these things, but why you should and where you should, um, and a couple of the tools that I think are most useful. So, all right, so a little bit of background on who I am. So, uh, <laughs> I'm going to give you a little bit of a timeline. Um, that picture was taken while I was at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. I majored in physics there, uh, and unfortunately, that photo has haunted me ever since. Uh, it's actually on our lab's website as a uh, consequence of a practical joke I played on my PI. So that is my profile picture if you go to my professional lab website. Um, but so while I was at Cal Poly, I had the unique opportunity uh, to be taught by Brian Granger, a longtime core developer of IPython and the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, he taught me quantum mechanics. And one day while we were sitting in quantum mechanics, uh, we were all looking at each other and talking about what the heck we were going to do with a physics major. And so we posed that problem to Brian in the middle of our class. And he said, if you uh, want to know what you're going to do with a physics major, come talk to me after this class and uh, in my office hour, and I will tell you. And I did that exact thing. I guess nobody else took that advice. Uh, but he hooked me up with IPython, and I got to actually work directly with Brian um, as a core developer for about a year, a little under a year. Um, which was great because it, it really launched my career. Uh, and then, so I did kind of start as a, as a scientist developing software for scientists. And then, uh, for better or for worse, I decided to go to graduate school uh, at the University of Oregon in the chemistry and biochemistry department just to, to change up fields a little bit uh, and kind of broaden my horizons a little bit. And I ended up in uh, Mike Harms' lab there where we study evolutionary biophysics. And I'll give you a little bit of background on what that is. So this is the Harms lab. Uh, that's Mike on the far left here. I'm next to him. Uh, you can tell we like to party. We show up with Nerf guns to our lab meetings. And uh, Luke over here, I realize has two drinks in his hands. Uh, one of them, I think, is champagne. I don't, we weren't celebrating anything, so I don't know why he had that. But uh, we study protein evolution, and uh, we're really interested in asking the question, well, what are the biophysical constraints that drive protein evolution as they acquire new functions over evolutionary time? Um, and that's a challenging question and a really broad question. We like to ask those in our lab. Um, and I won't get too much into the details uh, of our research because it's really outside the, the scope of this talk. But uh, I will just briefly say that all these people that you see in this picture, with the exception of me, uh, and there's a couple undergrads in this picture um, that do a little bit of computational work, um, they're all experimentalists. And so they go out there and measure these really uh, um, complex data sets, gather these complex data sets. Uh, basically what we do is we look at families of proteins and align these modern sequences we pull from different species, and we infer an ancestral state of that sequence. So we infer an ancient 200 million year old protein, and we do what we call resurrect it in lab. And our, uh, our experimentalist will actually create that protein, synthesize it in our lab, and then measure its biophysical properties. And then we will trace it over evolutionary time. Well, that results in a lot of data. Um, and we really rely on computational tools and resources to be able to take that problem apart and dissect that. So we use all kinds of bioinformatics, machine learning, and phylogenetics of the sort. And, and so that's where I come into it, is to really work with them. So, uh, just to reiterate this, I am purely a computationalist. I don't do any lab work. It's actually pretty terrifying if I'm in the lab. Um, I've never touched a pipette before. Um, we actually have a physical wall between the lab because I'm clumsy enough. Uh, so I get, this means that I get the unique opportunity to share code with what I'm going to call non-coders so that I can broaden it a little bit. This could even apply to data scientists talking to their clients. Um, so, it's really challenging sometimes to, to have this conversation with them. Um, a lot of them can be intimidated by something like a terminal or a command line uh, or scripts. And so uh, really trying to facilitate uh, this one-way direction, talking to them. Uh, and then conversely, they have the benefit of having to try to explain their complex experiments to a guy, like I said, who's never touched a pipette. 
And so uh, this really is a two-way street, and it turns out they're really good at explaining experimental stuff to me, the ignorant computationalists, and uh, it really wasn't until a lot of trial and error that uh, I could effectively communicate our computational analysis back to them. Um, so I want to take one step back and just acknowledge those people. So again, the Harms Lab for putting up with talking to me, a computationalist. We also have two collaborations um, that are going worldwide. One is the uh, Martin Lab, uh, Rowena Martin, who's uh, the young lady right here in the middle, uh, at Australia National University. So this is really sweet because we do really get to work from two sides of the globe. Uh, they're studying a really interesting problem. They're studying uh, malaria and how that parasite has evolved over the last 50 years. Um, and they can actually see, as we treat it with antibiotics, how it's acquired resistance. Uh, and it's crazy data. So I work with them um, and I do a lot of their uh, uh, statistical inferences about that data set. And then the second group there uh, is Susan Marksy group at UC Berkeley. And they study a, a particular protein that evolved a new way to fold, a new mechanism for folding. Um, and so that's an interesting evolutionary transition. Again, all experimentalists. So uh, I get to be the IT guy for these these groups, which is a lot of fun. All right, so the topic today I want to talk about is sharing computational analyses with non-computational collaborators. Um, and these are a list of challenges that I've experienced, uh, and I'm just going to list them out. Uh, number one is just getting code to run on someone else's machine, especially when they have no computational experience. Uh, it turns out a terminal, like I said, is very intimidating to someone who's never programmed before. Um, not because they're dumb, just because it is an intimidating environment the first time you see it. Um, and so uh, always trying to work with them on that uh, can be difficult. The second is setting up environments. So installing Python has become really easy recently. It didn't used to be. Um, and, and versioning Python. Um, but there's even that extra load of getting dependencies to install and work properly, especially if we create uh, libraries and APIs in-house in our lab. Uh, sometimes that requires you know, a little bit extra attention, and, and getting it stable and on someone else's machine is another uh, problem. Number three, uh, explanation beyond doctrines. It turns out that my experimental col uh, collaborators do not like receiving a Python script with doctrines and comments only baked into the source code. Uh, they want something that's a little bit more human readable and something that they see often. Um, so some sort of plain text view uh, obviously is attractive. And then this is kind of an extra added bonus, but uh, the other thing that they don't find useful is if I just send them a script to one, run anal one analysis on one particular uh, data file they gave me. Um, we really want to allow them to receive our programs um, with as low of a barrier as possible and then be able to try it uh, on many data sets that they have, uh, and so some sort of easy interaction that we can give them without there being any extra code that they have to write um, would be a plus. And so the theme of these four things is to come up with a way to get code and programming out of the way, and just get them interacting with their data as quickly as possible. All right, so the plan for this talk going forward is to highlight how Jupiter and different pieces within the Jupiter sphere uh, bridges the gap between coders and non-coders. Uh, and so this is kind of an outline of where I'm going to go for the rest of the talk. Uh, so I broke it up into two parts. And the first part is how we can better collaborate with uh, non-coders. So this is kind of locally. Maybe this is lab mates in your, in your, or uh, grad students in your lab, uh, or alternatively external uh, collaborators you know, in another lab that you're trying to uh, write analyses for. So I'm going to touch on uh, the notebook, and none of these things, you know, all, we've all heard of all these things throughout this conference already, so this isn't new, but I'm going to just try to spin it in this light of addressing this problem of collaborating. Uh, so the notebook for, for explaining and analyzing and exploring data, IPython widgets to interact with the data, and JupyterHub, which is, is really uh, maybe my favorite part of this particular first part, um, which allows us to do things like uh, pass data around with a nice GUI interface, uh, share data in that way, and also get notebooks up and running out of box. They don't have to do any of the managing of environments. Uh, I can do that on my end as the expert, supposed expert. And then the part two is, is really going to be turning this around and uh, collaborating with the scientific community, which means once you're ready to share this data with other people and put this out there in public um, for the scientific community to see, uh, this is kind of a couple tools you can use to do that 
effectively and, uh, and reach a broad audience. So obviously GitHub, we've all know. Um, I'm gonna talk about how you can use that for notebooks, MB Viewer, and, and the binder service. Okay, part one, so collaborating with non-coders. So to a computationalist, I define the notebook as this interactive computing environment or document uh, for exploring data. So in this next video, I'm gonna fire up a notebook and I'm not live coding this. I do not program this quickly. Uh, I just wanna show kind of the, I want you to see the movement of the notebook as it's being written. So it's just a, a screencast of me writing a, a simple analysis to uh, fit a spectra. Um, so this is just made up data. But what I wanna highlight here is that the notebook to a coder uh, has this really nice fluid uh, uh, environment where you can explore the data, you can interact with it, you can write a chunk of code, really quickly test it out, go back, fix something. Uh, and so it leads to this nonlinear workflow that I actually believe is really powerful for a data scientist, for a computational scientist who really wants to just explore data, kind of dirty, quick and dirty uh, in real time. Uh, I've also heard that it's argued that this might actually be a dangerous feature of the notebook um, because what happens is you accidentally write something that lives in your namespace, delete that cell, and then it lives there continuously until you restart the kernel, and then it gets you in trouble later. Maybe you have it in another spot in your code. So you could argue either way, but at the end of the day, you always go back, you hit that kernel, restart, run all, to make sure that it works in a nice linear fashion, and that's what you pass to your collaborators. And that's where the, I make the last point, which is this simple reproducibility. At the end of the day, you, if you can get this thing to run uh, just by clicking go, um, that's a really nice document to hand off to your collaborators. Cool. So to a non-computationalist, the notebook is just this interactive data document that happens to have some code in it. So when I pass these off to my collaborators, I actually often tell them to completely ignore the code cells. Just read the text, whatever I have written to you um, that explains what's going on underneath the hood. And then usually, uh, which I didn't, you didn't see quite in that video, but uh, I expose some sort of uh, widget or something that you can interact with that allows you to get away from having to hard code parameters in or input in. You just run it through a widget uh, and, and that's a familiar interface for them. So that's what I'm gonna show here. All right, so this is the notebook that I created um, on the last slide. And uh, the nice thing, some of the nice things that the notebook provides, of course, is that we have these markdown cells that are very human readable. Like I said, you can tell them to ignore the code, just look at the text that you see that looks like normal text to you, not comment it out. Uh, the other thing that the notebook provides is uh, this beautiful rendering, if you use Pandas, rendering of uh, ex uh, data frames, which looks just like an Excel spreadsheet. So again, it doesn't scare away my uh, biologist that I interact with who use Excel sheets almost explicitly still, unfortunately. Uh, you got your plots in line, of course. Uh, you can explain the math that's going on underneath hood using LaTeX. Um, so we all know this already, but I just wanna highlight those are the things that, that your experimentalists and your non-coders uh, actually really appreciate. You're not handing them a Python script with this uh, code just baked into it. Okay. Okay, the next thing, oops. To a computationalist, the IPython widgets, so this is speaking from the perspective of a user of IPython widgets, not a developer. So I'm not talking about the internals. We could go on for days about how those are written. But to you as a user or a computationalist, they really just provide a toolkit for simple to create UIs that you can expose your collaborators to and then they don't have to worry about coding at all. You basically take out the programming for them and allow them just to interact with these interfaces that are really simple. And so that was uh, in that, going back to that notebook, oops, sorry. Yeah. At the very bottom there, I have this nice IPython widget. The first time I tried to fit uh, this curve with just a normal, uh, scikit-learn, or sorry, scipy optimize function, curve fit function, it didn't uh, optimize, 
We gave it bad guess parameters. And this is one of my favorite parts about IPython widgets, especially when I'm giving it to my collaborators, because uh, it always is annoying when you're trying to punch in guess values on a fit. I mean, this is a, a simple one we should be able to fit no matter what. But uh, I find it's always hard to, to try to sweep through guess parameters manually. And so you can just create a simple IPython widget, and you can see this happens to fit right when I launch the widget. But there are times where you, know, you hit that regime where it doesn't fit. And so you can use these IPython widgets as a UI to quickly fit your data, which is really attractive uh, not just to me as a, as a developer, um, but also to my collaborators. One step further, I have another notebook where I, I push that. Sorry, I should have ran all these before. I push that widget one step further. Um, and if you notice, this code that I have inside this widget is nothing more than what I put up here in these cells. I just kind of put it in under this function and then wrapped it with IPython widgets interact. So it, it, it's really no extra overhead to you as a computationalist to provide this. But what comes out the other end here is all of a sudden they can start loading in different spectra and fitting those with these widgets. So this is the kind of front end that I provide to collaborators that again kind of cuts out code and allows them to go straight to uh, analyzing their data. Cool. So this, to a non-computationalist, IPython widgets really allows them to change the output without writing any extra code. And that, that is a huge plus, I promise you, when you start interacting with people who don't like to code or don't have the, the, the time to code when they're worrying about their experiments. All right, and then the last thing uh, in this part is uh, the Jupyter Hub. So in our lab, we launched a Jupyter Hub to provide an environment for all of my computationalist coworkers and lab mates. Uh, so they can do their own analysis if they want to, but they don't have to worry about installing anything on their computer, setting up any Python environments. I put all that heavy lifting on me as a computationalist because I'm supposed to be the expert in the room. So just like I don't ask them to, uh, or they don't ask me to troubleshoot their experiments, which would be a bad idea, uh, I don't ask them to troubleshoot their computational side. I handle it for them. And so we just launch on a, on a simple Ubuntu server, uh, Jupyter Hub, out of the box, PAM Authenticator, with, uh, and we just give them all sister, system user accounts. And uh, that's what the Jupyter Hub becomes for us, is really just this multi-user hub. And so as a uh, admin to this, as the computationalist, I fire up an account, and maybe I'm collaborating with someone. Uh, so for example, our, our group in Australia, Sorry, it's slow internet when I was recording this. Oh, and we use Jupyter Lab too in our Jupyter Hub, which I was told is an adventurous move. So if you're not used to that interface, that's the next generation of notebooks. But you can see there's a panel that comes provided right here in that Jupyter Hub that shows all your system users. We go on here and we create user accounts for all of our collaborating groups. So Susan Marksy's group, we have one, um, and Rowena's group. And I created a JupyterCon on this particular example. But when I have that available to me, I write my analysis on my uh, account. I just pull up a terminal, and I just move that analysis right over into my collaborator's account. So then all those files and everything that I built for them is already there. I've also installed everything on their account for them, all the Python environment, all the dependencies they need to run that notebook. I've loaded all the data in there, and it's ready to go. So to a, a non-computationalist, I believe the Jupyter Hub should be defined as the best thing since sliced bread. Because here's what they get to do. They see this interface. I give them the URL, the static URL that we have for our Ubuntu server. I give them the credentials that we gave them for their lab to log into this data. They fire it up. And they'll see when they enter their lab the exact folder. That's uh, experimental warning there. Uh, that I gave them right there. So that's the notebook or the folder that I moved over. They can open up the notebook that I gave them and it runs ready to go. So they just click go. Um, and so for them, there's no extra overhead of trying to learn and, and set up a computational environment. There's no terminal, if you notice that. It was all GUI front end interfaces. The other thing is, uh, I don't show in this video, but of course, um, there's a nice upload button here. So when they get data, they just keep adding it up to there and then I can hop on and do an analysis on that data and then post it for them to use. So it's really the Jupyter Hub that allows this to happen. So this is kind of our, just a map of our 
connections as collaborators. And we have many more. This is just the ones that I'm particularly affiliated with. But it's really um, these three tools that have let us uh, collaborate really on a global scale. So conclusions for part one. I'm just going to check these off. We got code running on someone else's computer who doesn't have computational experience. They just logged into a Jupyter Hub with credentials we sent them, and it was ready to go. Next is setting up uh, environments. Again, did that as well. Explanation beyond doc strings. That wasn't a very pretty notebook because I wrote it very quickly. But you can see it was really easy to follow. I used markdown cells. They didn't have to look at the code. We even actually have an extension that we wrote that just hides the code cells and just print, prints out the document with the widget ready to go so they could try and loading in their different spectra and fitting it. Uh, and then, of course, the IPython widgets we use to allow them to load in data, uh, filter through different data sets, try different uh, fitting models, uh, and, and interact with their data directly without having to write code. All right. So part two is collaborating with a scientific community. Uh, and so I just want to say to start, Jupyter, uh, since I have been away from it, uh, actually, and been more of a fanboy rather than a developer, um, really makes publishing reproducible code analyses uh, easier than ever before. And I'm going to prove that in this part. But uh, specifically, I'm just going to mention these three services. There are uh, other services that I actually just became aware of um, that should fall on this list. I just didn't get to add them to my talk. But um, for all of this, I'm going to just uh, use a paper that we wrote earlier this year as an example um, that is published in genetics. And, and so uh, along with it, we published a set of reproducible Jupyter notebooks that recreate all the figures in that paper. So you can just download them and run them and get them up and rolling right away. Uh, and so sorry, I should you can't see that because it's really small. Let me pull up. Uh, here's paper on genetics. You'll see under our method section, uh, you'll see the computational method section that talks about the software we use and then a data availability. And right there is a GitHub link directly to the notebooks for this, which you can click in that article and it takes you directly to a repo that I'm going to show you also has statically rendered versions of the notebooks and runnable versions of the notebooks through the binder service, which I'm going to highlight here in this talk. So this means that to recreate this paper that we published earlier this year, you don't have to download a single thing. You just click on these badges down here, and you can get them fired up and running. And you can test and make sure you get the exact same results that we do. You can also try other analyses in those notebooks. So uh, just to define GitHub in this context really provides a sustainable home for notebooks specifically the notebooks you're trying to share with the scientific community. Um, it's free. <laughs> it renders notebooks statically. That's kind of, I think, uh, only a year old feature, which is really sweet. Um, GitHub recognizes the importance, I think, of Jupyter Notebooks. Three, uh, downloading notebooks is easy. You actually don't have to have a GitHub account to download notebooks from a repo. You just look up the repo and, and grab them. And uh, so that's really nice for people who aren't, again, going to be GitHub users who just want to look at our analysis and run it. We're not the only people who have written reproducible notebooks with their publications. There's an entire list devoted to this. My slides, uh, by the way, are also available on GitHub. But this is a link that will take you to a whole list of papers that have been written um, in Jupyter Notebooks. Um, and so this is kind of a new emerging thing in the, in the you know, days of open science that are starting to arise and take off. MB Viewer. Uh, is just a service that allows you to, to share static notebooks. People use these for blogs all the time. Um, so you can just go to this website. It looks like this. Um, and it's really easy. You can just point to a GitHub repo right here. Um, and it will fire up a static version of your notebook. Uh, we actually have them for our paper here. So you can see, oh, I want to see what figure three looks like uh, for this paper, if I can get internet. And it will just take you to a, a statically rendered version of that notebook. I won't wait on the internet. Yeah, there we go. Um, so you can use them, again, to share your analyses in a static way. If people don't have any interest in, in running it, but they just want to read about it, uh, it's all there. So I just want to say that the MB Viewer is great for supplements. And it actually uh, turns out, I think it's a little bit of a myth that papers won't take these as supplements. 
um, and a lot of the journals that we interact with, as long as you have a sustainable home like GitHub, uh, they will, will take this as a, as a reasonable place to serve your data and host your data. Um, and so, you know, that, know that going into it. <laughs> um, and then the last service I want to highlight is Binder, uh, which is currently in beta version. It, it, had its, uh, it was up and running for about a year, and then I think they got a lot more traffic than they were expecting. And so they took it down and decided to rebuild it. Um, but this is amazing, because now you can share executable notebooks uh, without it, in the browser without anyone having to download anything. It's already up and running. The environment is set up for you. Um, and that's at beta, mybinder.org. It looks something like this. You just load in a, a name of your GitHub repository, or you can link to some other um, repository. And you can say a path to a notebook, and you just click launch, and it will fire up. Uh, it will grab your notebooks from wherever they are, scrape them, uh, build a nice instance to run those notebooks and fire them up uh, in a Jupyter Hub, actually, underneath the hood. And yeah, have runnable notebooks right there without them having to install anything. And you can ask many people to fire them up um, in parallel if you want. So MB Viewer is good for supplements. Binder is even better. Because now your notebooks are no longer static, viewable documents. They're actually runnable. So you can use them to recreate analyses that were actually published. Um, so I, I suggest that at this point, uh, there really is no excuse to write a paper that's not reproducible. <laughs> um, you, everything should be reproducible nowadays with this kind of technology, especially um, the things within the Jupiter sphere. So that's kind of a point I want to make very, very clear, and uh, then I'll get off my soapbox, is that uh, reproducibility is so easy nowadays um, that we should all be doing it, and I, I will prove it. So um, I'm going to go ahead and take that notebook that I wrote uh, super fast that you saw me do live coding. Um, I have that whole repository right here. Um, it's now, it, it is a git repo. You can tell I ran things, let's commit. All right. Um, I'm going to mirror this and create a new GitHub repo fresh right here, right? So I have, I'm just going to name it JupyterCon Reproducible Notebooks. Um, we'll write a little description, fire that up. We can grab this. Oh, actually, I think I already have this all set up. You just add it to a uh, remote like I have here. And if I just push this repo up to that, you'll see it is all ready to go here. Um, I can take that repo, point binder to it, Say I want you to open up the uh, particular notebook I'm interested in and just launch it. That's going to take a few seconds. Maybe not. We'll come back to that. Um, and in seconds, we've taken a re uh, an analysis that we just wrote in a few minutes. We've pushed it up to GitHub, and now it's going to be shared uh, publicly that people can run in the browser without ever downloading it, without ever getting Python set up on their machine, and it's ready to go. Um, so while we let that build, I'll continue on and come back to it. But this is where I want to round it off and just say this, this was to highlight what I said earlier. Jupyter makes reproduce, uh, publishing reproducible analyses so easy, easier than ever before, um, that this really should be kind of a new norm in moving forward as you're making uh, uh, analyses and you're sharing things not just with your collaborators, but with the scientific community. So just to touch on things that we've talked about. Um, so first part was collaborating with non-coders. These are kind of the three things. And there's many more, like I said, tools underneath uh, the Jupyter uh, ecosystem, Jupyter orbit, as I called it here, that can help you in this. But, uh, and then part two was collaborating with the scientific community. And so if we go back to this, man, Binder's working a little slow on overload right now. 
uh, it's so easy to go from a, a analysis that you just wrote in-house to, to being able to share it across a bunch of machines. All right. So final conclusion, uh, Jupyter makes collaboration easy. That was my title. And the way it does that is by allowing programmers to program. It allows us to take the heavy load, setting up environments, getting things ready for our collaborators, and allows the collaborator, collaborators to focus on their work, to focus on their experiments, and then when they need to look at and interpret the data, it's ready to go, ready to fire up. Um, and just before I finish here, I want to uh, mention two things that I'm pretty excited about in the context of this problem. Jupyter Lab, which we've seen some amazing demos, is phenomenal. It's been really fun to watch them develop that. Uh, I've also been able to write, uh, help write a couple extensions, which has been uh, quite fun. It's amazing. Like I, I have a, a multiple sequence alignment um, I didn't write, but helped write, uh, that allows you to view that right there next to your notebook if you're analyzing sequence data. Uh, and then, of course, Jupyter Google Drive. Um, is kind of a glimpse at what's going to be, I think, the future of Jupyter Notebook, which is this real-time collaboration um, notebook environment where you can actually have multiple people working on the same notebook, which will be really huge in the context of everything I presented here because I showed you that I had to move analyses between accounts and get them fired up on their own machine. This will be, I can just work directly with them with a little Google chat window next to it um, and walk them through analyses in real time. Um, and so that, that's going to be really huge. Keep an eye out for that. With that, I just want to thank you. That's my information on Twitter, uh, GitHub, and Gmail. And let's just see. So this was that uh, binder that you saw. So now it's, we're able to run it. Dependencies are all set. Um, and just for fun and for proof of concept, I think you guys should all run it too. You can either go to that GitHub repo, there's a little badge on it. There's also, you can go to this bit.ly link, because I couldn't come up with a short enough <laughs> link. Um, if you go to that right now, you can run that in a notebook that we just wrote here. Oh no, it's not working? Well, it looks to me. I think I pressed launch, nothing happened. It might be a JavaScript program or something. Oh, bummer. Dang it. Live demoing is always troubling. But uh, we, can, we can see if it works afterwards. But, um, so yeah, with that, I just want to thank you guys for coming to my talk. Thank you to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak here. And I'll take any questions. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. I'm trying to Jupyter to work for a person. Yeah. I've seen a lot of these notebooks for people locked in widgets. But so say you write a notebook and then I open it. Mm -hmm. Do you teach me to like rerun everything first and then interact with widgets? Do you teach me to jump through cell by cell? Like, yeah. Right, right. So uh, the question was, do I basically tell my collaborators beforehand how to get the notebook started so they can start using widgets properly? Does that sound about right? So yeah, so I, I always make it so that uh, when I pass a notebook off, you click run all from the start. Okay. And then everything lives as is. I mean, uh, that might not work for everyone's workflow, though. So. Uh, I, I purposely put things in linear fashion, and things that I've analyses that I've done are okay with that. You can you can have things linear like that, and so I just tell them go in, click run all, and then start playing with widgets. Um, and then the widgets then they can tell something really local, so if they're messing in the middle, they don't have to worry about it putting it in a state. Right. Yeah. Usually I do. So I usually create a unique widget for each portion that they're, they want to look at. So uh, it will only control whatever is right below it. It won't control some view that's, that's higher up on the notebook or, or lower in the notebook. Yeah. Um, and I think for the sake of simplicity, it might be worth doing that uh, for, for, yeah, for, for experimentalists. So yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so it, depends, it depends on the context. So in lab, you know, with my, my lab mates, it's really easy for them to just turn their chair around, which actually we don't do. We slack each other, even though, like, like Luke's sitting right here, you could just say it to me. Um, but uh, yeah, so in, in the lab, we, 
it, it's usually just we just say it to each other. But for for uh, like the lab in Australia, you know, I can't be the IT guy that flies out to Australia to fix things for them. And so uh, for us, it is usually just communicating through email. Um, I, we also set up Gitter channels on certain uh, projects. So like we, we have notebook uh, repositories for a particular project living on GitHub that we are using for our collaboration. And then we set a Gitter account on that that we can communicate through. So that's one uh, strategy. There's talk that JupyterLab will have chat room like extensions, and that will be the dream that I hope we get to. How do you think startups improve well, JupyterLab is a repository? How did I do it? Yeah, yeah, so there yeah, there is actually a Jupyter Lab extension, um, a Jupyter Hub Jupyter Lab extension on GitHub. Uh, and, yeah, so if you look, I think if you go to the Jupyter Hub document, it's it's very uh, uh, questionably documented, <laughs> but there is a spot in like the the frequently asked questions section I think of Jupyter Hub that says how do you get Jupyter Lab running? Uh, if if Jupyter Lab is alpha, really alpha, the extension is really really alpha. So like there's definitely some sketchy things that go on, but that's okay. I mean it'll it'll get there. And uh, fortunately, I work with people that don't really care. I mean at, at, to some level, they just want to run notebooks. And so it's OK. But if, you're, if you have a team of technical people, they might get frustrated because it is pretty um, unstable right now. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, it, so it should actually work no problem um, because, well, so it depends. Uh, I'm, I'm not super. So to answer your question, so sorry, I'll repeat your question. I should have done that earlier. But uh, have I used any third-party extensions with the binder service? I know that they allow you to install them. Um, I mean, I, I think it's just Conda install is how they do all their stuff. So as long as Conda can build it, it should be fine. Um, but you know, it, it depends on what that extension has as its installation. Yep. Yeah, so that, this is not a great solution to roll out for big data problems. Um, I think, I mean, you always have that problem, though, if, you're, if you are working for, you know, if you publish a paper and you have big data that goes with it, they're going to ask you to, to put it somewhere that's going to sustain, you know, be sustainable. And so um, currently we don't put it like on GitHub. Um, if we have anything that we need to roll out with large data, it's going to live on our university server, and then we do provide a, a, a Jupyter front end for that. Um, that takes a lot more work, obviously. It's not just out of the box. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't know of a better solution currently that exists. Like, Binder won't accept it either, because uh, it's got to be on GitHub. Yeah, so uh, for me, the, the data lives wherever it needs to, and then the Jupyter notebooks that, we go, that go with it have to live, unfortunately, in that spot as well. Um, but. Yeah, uh, well, so I actually don't know. I, I've, I've never actually tried. You might be able to actually link to something external. It just depends on what your credentials are to get into it. Because if you put it on Binder, your credentials are there. Right. You know, so if you're trying to log into like a, you know, a Dropbox folder or, or some other place that you have it hosted, um, you have the risk of putting your, your login information in that. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, guys. <laughs>